Welcome to week eight of HI3284. And this week we're thinking about official records and official traces of human lives. Right at the start of the subject, we talked about what records and repositories are used by historians, and we mentioned some of these. We're going back to that, we're picking up on those themes, and we're thinking about what records exist, where they're held, how we access them, and what historians do with them, what use can be made of these in terms of uncovering the past and finding out about human lives. And here's how we're going to do that. We're going to consider what records exist and how to access them. And we're also going to consider the limits to official records because not everything is recorded and not all records survive. And then we're going to consider what historians have done with official records and what kinds of historians access what kinds of records. There are many kinds of official records and state record keeping has become increasingly reliable. You might like to pause for a moment and consider what records of your life exist. And there will be a whole lot of them. Things like your birth, possibly your baptism, which is a, a church record rather than a state record, but still official. Your school enrollment, maybe you've got a passport and there'll be a record of that. Maybe you've taken out citizenship. That'll be recorded too. Maybe you've engaged in major life events like marriage or divorce. Maybe with divorce too, there are records around things like the care of children from that defunct relationship. And if you've had children, I really hope that you made the effort to register their births. And if you have, you can count that as a record as well. Your name will be on it. You might also be in official records for your work. Are you in records held by any of the armed services? You should all be on the electoral roll. And as you'll know, you should also be recorded in the census. Possibly you've registered a car. Possibly you have a driver's license. Possibly you're on property titles. Possibly you're mentioned in probate records. Maybe you've applied for grants from official sources. Perhaps you have made a submission to a Senate inquiry. And perhaps, like me, your official records are spread across more than one country and within Australia across more than one state, as well as between state-level registration and Commonwealth-level registration. You may also be recorded at local level for things like parking tickets or matters to do with property, like property records or planning permission applications. Considering your own life and where it is recorded helps give you a sense of the depth of state record keeping. And as you'll know from our discussion of cemeteries, state record keeping has not been perfect, but it is becoming increasingly reliable. Pre-modern states kept interesting records as well. On this slide is an image of the Doomsday Book, which was a 1085 survey of everything that was taxable in England, taken by William the Conqueror. There is an extraordinary depth to official records, but that depth of record keeping when it reflects the control of the state can make accessing these records confronting. In Australia, in particular, state control of Aboriginal people and also state control of convicts and their lives can be confronting. For people whose family are captured in those records, and captured in those records being controlled or coerced by the state, official archives can be difficult places. And it's worth remembering that. And that brings us as well to the next point on the slide, that states have kept all sorts of records, but there must be a balance and access to those records between transparency and understanding of what the state was doing and respect for personal sensitivities. There's also restrictions on access in terms of state security, but that's another matter. And the creation of these records reflects that tension between transparency and privacy. Hansard is an account of everything that's said in Parliament, because by the time the Australian colonies are established, and certainly by the time of Federation, the English system considers that it is appropriate for citizens to be able to access 
the discussions of their parliament. And that's something that is still current in the present. There is enormous expertise and expense allocated to making sure that parliamentary discussions are available practically in real time these days. But official records are incomplete accounts of people's lives and what does exist is not entirely accessible and what has existed may no longer exist. I mentioned that right to privacy for individuals, the state can also assert its right to confidentiality. And as a powerful entity, it exerts quite a bit of control. Back in 2020, there was considerable kerfuffle around whether the letters between the Governor-General of Australia and the Queen around the Whitlam dismissal should be released. That release of the Palace Papers required a High Court decision that they were papers of state rather than personal papers. So there's a tension there between the rights to privacy of the Queen as an individual and the rights of citizens to transparency from their various forms of government. The case was determined in the High Court and the papers were released after 31 years as state records need to be. Similarly, ASIO records, records of Australia's Secret Service, are only released on request and only after that 31 years has elapsed. They're not automatically released and they're not necessarily released in full. They go through a process of being redacted. So information that is considered still sensitive is blacked out and made unavailable to researchers. That's deliberate control of official records though official records are also limited because they take up space. Various repositories have gone through culls and destroyed sections of their records simply because they don't have the space to keep them. There's a reference on the slide to that process and Australian war records and there has been kerfuffle around the National Library of New Zealand getting rid of material that doesn't correspond to its national interest because it simply doesn't have the space to keep records relating to other nations. Again, here's Claire's fascination with nationalism and the writing of history. Because of constraints on space, national repositories are increasingly limiting their collections along national borders. And even if records exist, and are in theory accessible, they may in practice be inaccessible. If you can't find out that something exists, you can't request it. And these are research libraries where you need to request items. You can't just browse open shelves and pull off things that look interesting. And things get destroyed. The Treaty of Waitangi, that founding document of New Zealand referred to generally as the treaty, is lucky to have survived into the present. And that bottom reference on the slide explains the ways in which that document has sustained damage and how we are lucky it is still with us. Having flagged the limits to official records though, it's worth noting that there's still plenty left for historians to deal with and they work with it in all sorts of ways. Some historians use state records more than others. I'm starting to turn to state records in my own work but because I've been interested in how people think about what they're doing in something in their spare time, the state records are not the most obvious place for me to start. There's some relevant legislation, but mostly I'm interested in those ideas. And so I look at memoirs, at guides to hunting, at letters, at diaries, organisational records of formal organisations, but not government departments, and at newspapers. And I look at those things because they're personal records of people's thinking and I can see what's important to them and why they did the things they did. I'm turning more to official records as people's lives brush up against the state and these records are becoming more accessible. Other historians start with official records. My JCU colleague, Russell McGregor, who's an adjunct but still very active, is quite different. His research interests have been in policy and management by the government of things to do with Australian Aboriginal people. 
He's also had a research interest in Aboriginal activists and their engagement with the state, their very deliberate engagement in trying to change policy and trying to manage state control of their lives. His work often starts with a report or with a piece of legislation or with a government inquiry. In his more recent work, he tracks government aspirations, particularly around the development of Northern Australia. And he looks at people's responses. Again, these things can be found in official documents, and that's where he looks for them. Different historians look at different sources because they're trying to understand different aspects of the past. But sources can be used in a variety of ways, and official records don't have just one use. They can be used to analyse those functions of state, government policy, military histories. They can also be used to look into more personal things. From the start of settler colonialism in Australia, the state exercised tight control over the convicts who were sent here and over the military who were sent to control them. There are all sorts of records in Australian history that don't exist in colonial societies that weren't established as penal colonies. In addition, control over Aboriginal people and their lives by the state was established fairly quickly in Australia. And again, there are all sorts of records that stem by that. And as I say, they can be distressing to people who recognise their relatives and who see them being mistreated by the state. It's not only Aboriginal people who have had their lives strongly controlled by the state. I have a friend and colleague who looks at children in care and histories of institutions and people managed by institutions. Those lives were also tightly regulated and those records still exist and are accessed by historians looking into these aspects of the past. And family historians are everywhere at present. You can see that in the reading for this week. You can see that in reading rooms all around the country. Often official records are used by family historians to track little known relatives or to bolster their accounts of better known relatives who might be able to leave their own stories as well. And as an environmental historian, I'm turning more to state records I am looking at interactions around licences, debates around legislation, engagement with parliamentary representatives, although I remain aware of the limits of the reach of the law. And in wild places, the law and the state aren't necessarily present. But for things to do with money and with property, record keeping is essential. That's a brisk account of all sorts of types of official records and the many uses they can be put to. I think what I'm really hoping you'll take from this week is that when you read a history that you like, you shouldn't just be reading the text, you should also be reading the footnotes. At this stage, it's good to look at how other historians put together their work, at the sources they draw on and how they use them. It may fill you with admiration for their imaginative uses of what look to be dry as dust records, or it may fill you with inspiration to go and look at these records yourself or at local variants of them and extend their projects in terms of understanding the past. And when I have suggested that official records might be dry as dust, I slander them. On this final slide are links to various Hansards. And Hansard is an interesting place in that while it is a record of Parliament and what is said in Parliament, what is said in Parliament is not necessarily dull and improvements in online searching make the quirks of parliamentary representation available to historians. Parliament is a representation of the people. We are in a representative democracy. Parliamentarians are supposed to to represent the views and concerns of their constituents. And the depth, availability and commitment by the state to making these records available and searchable mean that there are all sorts of gems that you can discover within this particular official source.
At that point, I think I urge you to go out and read footnotes and see what sources historians are using to construct their understandings of the past and to support their arguments about history.